when we, sorry, when we look at learning outcome four is primarily oriented towards HR. So what I've done is I've um, literally got, you know, three uh, different presentations, which I'm going to, um, you know, hopefully try and run, run through some of the slides today. But if we are not able to complete, then, you know, obviously we'll carry on, uh, you know, with this particular session next time um, to, you know, uh, obviously complete the uh, learning outcome four. So what I've got is I've segregated three things down into three different, uh, you know, presentations. And uh, what we are going to do is at some stage when we look at them, we look at them individually. The reason I say that is because um, these all the three topics, you know, that we're going to cover. One is to do with understanding the application of motivation theories in particular. So as you know that you know some of the units that we have covered so far uh, in terms of the course, we have discussed three things which have come off and on again and again. One is, uh, you know, leadership theories. We have looked at motivation theories. So these theories came across, you know, in uh, a unit called people in organization at level four. We also did briefly study motivation theories, uh, you know, in unit 5.9, which was personal and professional development. And then this is the third time we will look at, you know, the motivation theories. But here, from an HR perspective, what we are not looking at doing is not going into the details of motivation theory, theory X and Y, mass model, you know, motivation. We are going to understand how these motivation theories are applied by HR managers within organization. And how do they get things done in terms of, you know, maintaining um, basic things like, you know, job, job rotation, you know, uh, looking at skills enhancement, looking at uh, motivation levels, looking at taking feedback from employees. So what we are going to study in this learning outcome four in task 4.1 is essentially looking at the application of these studies in, uh, by HR managers and how do they look at getting the best out of their employees uh, using this application. So we're going to be talking about things like if I, if I have to, uh, you know, look at we're going to be talking about things like, you know, a uh, job characteristic model, which is called the GCM model. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail. This is what we will cover in task 4.1. And the idea here would be to understand how job rotation works, how job enrollment, uh, enlargement works, and how do we look at job enrichment. So sometimes you get to see people working within a particular department and within particular role, but what needs to happen year on year or, you know, after a number of years in that role is the employee needs to get um, a certain bit of, you know, um, obviously they go through reviews, but the reviews identify that the employee is performing well and, you know, would need more motivation, more delegation or more responsibility. So then HR's men, HR managers or people in the human resources, essentially when they do this review, uh, they basically look at experimenting with something called the JCM model. And the job characteristic model basically looks at providing changing work environment to the individual in order to keep them motivated. And how does this changing environment happen? This happens through job enrollment, uh, sorry, job enlargement, job enrichment, and also through job rotation, right? So we will discuss this in the first, uh, you know, presentation, which is 4.1, to understand the applicability of these theories and how they can be applied and what do, what do we mean when we do the application and how it is obtained. The second bit that we're going to look at is, we're going to look at essentially, um, you know, coaching and mentoring. Now here, what we want to be able to understand is what is the difference between coaching? Um, what are the usage of coach, coaching? And then what are the differences between coaching and mentoring? The reason why we want to look at this is because as employees move up in uh, their job roles and obviously within the organization, at some stage, what the HR has to do is has to identify clearly the talent, the skill set within an individual, and then they have to look at managing it. Now, how they manage it is the area and uh, you know the process of doing coaching and mentoring if you have a senior you know employee who's accumulated a number of years of experience has when i say well rounded experience within the department they then get to coach uh, they then become you know in a coaching position but we will look at 
how coaching is different from mentoring. So they become mentors and they have mentees or new joinees assigned to them so that they can train them. And as a result, also they get something which is, um, you know, uh, peers to work with. That means they have some supervisory responsibility and they become kind of mentors, but also have responsibility in terms of managing their mentee. So we will look at that whole concept of coaching and mentoring and how HR uses this to develop skills uh, and, you know, give job in enlargement to existing employees within the organization. And how does this help the organization engage with new joinees and create a rapport in skills between the new joinees and the one who is very well experienced. And the third part that we are going to look at covering in this uh, learning outcome from an HR perspective is we are going to look at the usefulness of training and development, right? How does training happen in the organization? What are the roles of training? What are the types of training? Why training is necessary? And how training leads to the development of individuals so that they are able to perform at their utmost capacity. Okay. And sometimes training and development is also given to individuals from a point of view of looking at motivation that you are wanted in the organization. So we are going to, uh, you know, train you uh, and develop you every year so that you are able to steadily move into progressive roles or higher roles within the organization. Is that okay? yeah. So it is, it is a, a particular topic wherein you will have to, you know, look at wearing kind of three hats because the learning outcome actually talks about understanding you know the role of how hr looks at developing res human resources resources in general we want to look at human resources people as a resource is that okay yeah all right so let's look at starting off with the first one um, in terms of you know the essentials of people management that means this is a book written by uh, you know three different people and i've taken extracts of the presentation from that book uh, basically uh, they, they are a specialist as a team, um, you know, who have written a number of books on organization behavior, HRM, and also people management. And this particular topic of how motivation theories can be applied, uh, understood, and then applied to the organization from an HR perspective is going to be covered in this particular part of the presentation. Any questions on this so far? Uh, not yet, no. So basically, when we look at these slides, you know, these few slides, um, I'm going to look at some of the important slides, but apart from that, I'm going to email them to you. Now, the whole idea of going through this deck of slides is that we want to understand how employees essentially can be motivated in a changing work environment, right? Where do you, where we always see that the work environment nowadays within companies is changing on a daily basis. The shift is happening because of technology. The shift could also be happening because of uh, the new challenges which the organization is facing. And this then brings an overall change in the working environment of the organization. And if I have to give an example, rather than talking generically here would be that you look at, um, say, a particular organization in the fast moving consumer sector, FMCG. Now there, if a competition, a competitor introduces a product, then the marketing department has to scramble to be able to come up with some sort of an alternative or some sort of a uh, you know answer to what has been introduced in the market because that has or starts to have a direct effect on sales of that particular product for for the organization and they could see this as a perceived threat that if the product is to become successful which has been introduced as a substitute by the competitor can lead to fall in sales over a period in time and put pressure on margins so this is an example of how dynamic today's companies are. And when they look at, uh, you know, operating in global environments, they see uh, this particular change happening uh, in the environment, you know, because of various reasons. And one good, one good possible reason could be because of their competitor activity. The other things that we will look at is we will understand the concept of how uh, you know, the job, um, uh, what do you call GCM model, which is basically the job characteristic model is applied. And when we look at the, uh, you know, the understanding of job characteristic model, we are going to be looking at, you know, primarily understanding what does that mean and how that can be used by, you know, the HR managers to, you know, um, uh, what do you call um, um, motivated employees in the organization. And then we look at some of the other concepts, you know, in terms of 
what that model means and what are the tools that model gives to the hr managers to be able to you know create or increase employee motivation so let's look at this um, you know jcm as a model basically consists of five things and these five things when you look at you know they are considered uh, important for this model uh, because this these are the cons constructs of this particular model so it looks at you know, the variety of skills the people have the kind of tasks they can do with those skills what is the relevance of their task that means the significance of the task can mean that at what level they are doing that role and how does it contribute to taking the objectives of the organization further we also look at something called autonomy that means is the person in that particular role autonomous is that person require does that person require supervision or does that person uh, is that person able to actually work independently without or with minimal supervision and then we look at the concept of feedback feedback means that you know some say if all these things are working well how does the staff or the employee actually look at you know um, receiving feedback if the feedback is given how does the feedback affect the you know um, the uh, outcome of the employee in terms of its uh, you know uh, in terms of its work does that feedback you know whether it's positive or negative but it does that feedback uh, kind of elicit what kind of reaction within the individual so we divide this into you know three uh, or four categories and the four dimensions you know these five qualities or the five traits which are basically described in this particular model um you know are kind of uh, code of what the job characteristics are when you recruit a particular person for a role so if example here would be um, to explain the model if i'm looking at if i run an organization which is an organization of plumbers for example and if i have to recruit a new uh, plumber into the organization uh, because of a vacancy which has come up i'm going to be focusing on three things first of the thing first uh, of these few things that we will look at is does that particular person being recruited has the skill to work within this role and what we are going to do is we are going to basically look at certain tasks or certain valid criteria to be able to validate the skills are present or not present so we could ask for example things like do you have a valid certification how many years have you worked can you produce a cv or can you do this and we might in some cases ask the person to be able to you know come in and do a particular job to see if the person has the skills or not we might not take the word for it and then what we look at is in the job given how significant are, or how experienced are they in terms of solving that particular issue so these are things that we look at and at some stage we add the add into the mix autonomy which is to say because of the experience the number of years of experience the individual has he or she can actually work independently and can bring the outcome uh, which is favorably required when the person is sent for a particular job okay and then the feedback is primarily looking at the results in terms of customer satisfaction so for example you've gone in and done a good job and the customer is happy and they left a positive review um, you know on the website or they put in a positive review to your manager saying that the person who came in was very professional and was able to solve the problem in the shortest possible time and we are happy with him um, you know we are happy with the services provided at this then feeds upwards into the organization at some stage for the person to move up into the organization in terms of promotion salary rise and things like that okay is that is that something which is clear uh yes um any questions with that with that be the same process for like write not job descriptions absolutely so if you look at the jcm you know model is primarily nothing but a detailed breakdown of your job description so the original you know characteristics of something called uh, you know your job role are actually yeah. proposed and broken down into a model so that we can clearly differentiate why we are hiring you what at what level we are hiring you because of your experience and prior knowledge and at some stage are you able to work autonomous autonomous you know kind of autonomously in that particular role so do you show autonomy in that particular role right so if you look at an organization just to quickly clarify this if you look at sometimes organizations go and pick up apprentices and people who are they try and develop through the on job training model right so here 
they want they want to get hold of fresh graduates but at the same point in time when they hold of fresh graduates get hold of fresh graduates from straight from the college or you know from the school their aim is to basically train them in the way they would feel uh, the training can be done and they would want to uh, make sure that they kind of uh, you know bring in that culture the attitude during the process of training that they do for these individuals but when you hire somebody who's experienced your job description changes accordingly you're not hiring somebody for on job training but you're hiring somebody because they have the experience and they come in and straight away make the ground they they you bring the job uh, come to the job and you know their ground straight away ground work right? yes so the job description that you put together can be broken down into something called a jcm so that you have clear characteristics which are defined you look at the core dimension of the job description of why you're hiring this person you look at the physiological states which is what kind of skills traits uh, experience autonomy does the person bring and how does it help him to do the job or do the work and what could be the possible outcomes because of that particular state of mind in terms of being a uh, a novice a beginner somebody who's experienced and somebody who's very well experienced okay yeah now we basically you know um here we are so the second thing is once we understood what is a job description and the types in terms of how it relates to you know um looking at hiring individuals what then we look at is this is the jobs that you do the and the type of role that you have at the hierarchy that you have in the organization you could have differences in emoluments for example if you are a fresher and you are starting you could be at a basic wage uh, you know in your starting but because you have 5 years of experience and you work within the sector you might demand that i will start at only 10 pound an hour and that at some stage would be just the salary or the uh, limit that you get so for example when you are under trial period but when you get confirmed you can say that you know um, because you're performing well and you're doing well and you've come across um, you know on the expectation of the uh, job description or the person that you worked under they might say okay we'll make you permanent at 12 pound an hour so what does that mean is the job description model characteristic model essentially helps you to design jobs which can give rewards so you can hire somebody at say basic wage for two or three months down the line when the trial period is over and you find that you are happy with the job uh, happy with the work that the person is doing the output of the person you then can look at making him permanent but at a slightly higher uh, pay and in this case what you could look at is because as a manager you know the personal situations of the individual you might then be able to differentiate in terms of how uh, would you make that permanent person permanent in the role by hiring him but also hiring him at a differential salary as compared to the others who are working within the department and that creates a motivation itself so an example here would be as an hr manager what i would say is i'm taking you on on the new role and you're going to be under probation for two months but once your probation ends and you're successful we are going to make you permanent at a slightly higher pay and that is going to be the permanent wage or permanent pay on the permanent role and that keeps you motivated and does not you know Uh, allow you to leave because you are determined to be completing the probation period on time and with the desired output they are asking for and because of which you are looking forward to achieving that goal of you know my pay for the next two months is this much but after when i get confirmed and i become a permanent employee i also get the other benefits like pensions you know my dental benefits or whatever it is uh, within becoming a part of the organization okay okay Okay. Now the other bits that we look at. Now, once imagine you've been in the organization, they are happy with it. You're working through the role, and you've been working within the organization for a number of years. How can sometimes the organizations have to reinvent themselves in terms of if the growth is not happening and the or the organization is very stable within the market, there's not much change happening. But at the same point in time, employees who work within the department want to look at a change. Want they want to. you know they want a bit of a change in their job in their routine in terms of the responsibility and that is where this concept of job rotation job enlargement and job enrichment comes in so for example here job rotation would be that somebody if you look at a store you know look at the retail stores for example um, i'm going to pick up say for example tesco now within this store 
if you know that when you apply for jobs in most cases they take they prefer to take you on uh, as a as a person who's going to be working on the floor and what they do is at certain uh, uh, you know for a certain number of months they move you across different departments so that you are able to pick up all the different functions um before you attain maybe a managerial or a supervisory position so you know how to cash the bills you know how to receive delivery you know how to lock the store or you know uh, look at a rota uh, or creation of a rota you know how to look at uh, you know shelving you look at basic functions in terms of the operation management which are required within a tesco store so in order to keep employees motivated sometimes you will get an individual which will say that okay i know all this i'm coming across from asdas but i want a pay rise and that's the reason i saw your advert and i want to apply here so what they know the hr manager knows that the person is definitely um, you know experienced but what they do is before they take on take them take him on onto a higher role they will put them through a job rotation in order to keep them motivated and say okay we are interested in you but what we want to do is basically do a bit of a trial and then the employee will be put through a periodic shifting activity of working from one task to the other which would test the employee in terms of the experience that they are claiming on the cv but also make them aware of how things are run within tescos have you seen that or have you experienced that within the place of work your place of work uh, yes sir uh, bhai yes sir bhai yes yeah. so sometimes you get to see people who work in the accounts department or any department for that sake what they will do is okay i've been you've been doing accounting for a number of years why don't you start also looking at now managing debt so what they do is they move him out of the accounts department within the accounts department but instead of invoicing they move into the de- managing debt at some stage they move him to managing cash flows and that allows the individual to build their experience but also keeps them motivated and also gives them the opportunity to develop their skill set in other areas of uh, you know the job job role and that concept is nothing but job rotation now what is job enrollment um uh, i don't know why this word enlargement a job enlargement is you give a promotion you know you increase the number of people working within a particular uh, you know post so you have more uh, reportees or peers working with you or for you you become a manager and that is the concept of job enlargement that's simple enough to understand so when you are due for a promotion and if you've been consistently performing the hr at some stage has to look at job enlargement for you because if they don't get the promotion or don't you know because to a certain extent rises in wages to a certain extent help but at some stage the employees are definitely looking at also moving up in the career ladder so if the job enlargement does not happen for or in terms of promotion does not happen for employees you will see that a good number of employees who have been working within the company for a number of years end up leaving because they do feel that you know their role is not expanding and that is the concept of job enlargement what is job enrichment here you are basically looking at uh, you know asking the employee to work in terms of the length and the breadth of the job role that they have so an example here would be that if you look at uh, say for example a few people working within the production floor and when they have to look at giving them some sort of additional responsibility what they tend to do is they get them involved in the engineering department as well which is a department just before production so once the products have been engineered or you know they've been assembled they then go into mass production so they ask them to develop backward vertical or horizontal kind of you know knowledge into that particular area of working and that would mean to a certain extent you will increase the salary make the give them the additional responsibility but their role in the organization more or less remains the same but you ask them to pick up an additional skill by allowing them to work across departments and that is where you will see job enrichment happening is that okay example here would be say if you look at any car manufacturing company nissan for example so employees who have become perfect within the production department are at some point in time asked to liaison and work with the engineering department closely they work with closely with the engineering department is because if they have a good understanding of how things are going to flow in from engineering to production that helps them adapt their teams well when they are working in the production floor 
and that gives them additional responsibility, also a bit of raise in salary, but also gives them the experience and knowledge required to understand uh, how things move between engineering and production because these two departments work hand in hand or very closely. And this is the concept where you will see something called job enrichment happening for some of the employees who are performing and who are doing well. Okay. An example here in this slide would be how do you look at, you know, enrichment? So sometimes combining tasks with, uh, with individual tasks could mean job, uh, you know, uh, enrichment. Say, for example, you do a set of tasks, but you also have been asked to manage a few tasks of the others. Or you've been asked to do that. You, say, for example, if a job has four parts, you're doing part one and the other three colleagues are doing part three other parts. But at some stage when the output has to be presented, you are asked to manage that output for presentation. Is that simple enough to understand? Yeah. yeah so if, if you're in an organization, you've been asked to uh, make a presentation in a team, what will happen is you'll end up choosing a team leader. The team leader will do his own part, but the other members of the team will do the other bits of preparing the presentation. But the team leader will end up presenting it in front of the board. And that would mean that he has a slightly higher role in terms of his colleagues. Correct? Yeah. And that would mean job enrichment. Okay. So this is an example of how in job enrichment, in some cases, you know, increases motivation. It reduces employee turnover and also to a certain extent, you know, reduces absenteeism. So what happens is you normally see that sometimes you would see that the employees get demotivated because they have been doing the same work for day in, day out for a number of years and they've not seen a change in their, uh, you know, work pattern. So the HR has to do a review and they have to pick this up to say that, okay, the person has the skills, they are able to do a variety of tasks, they they're, they're, the tasks that they do, is done you know uh, significantly well or it meets the criteria they are able to work independently and the feedback that they receive is also quite positive and you know because of which we need to look at enriching or you know giving them some larger responsibility which will keep them within the organization okay now what are the other flexible things that you look at so you have job enlargement job rotation and you have something which is to do with you know uh, enrichment now the other tools which the hr managers have when they look at the process of you know um, um you know motivating employees they look at flexible working they look at job sharing and in some cases when you look at telecommuting or remote working right so flexible timing could be when you see people in the management role they uh, you know they are more concerned with getting the output or getting the work done and sometimes you get to see that they are not very too, uh, not very fussed about the fact that, you know, if they are coming in on time or leaving on time, their role involves getting jobs done. And sometimes you will get to see that they are allowed to work flexibly. There are situations in which if you are not well and, uh, you know, you need flexibility, that would also mean that you get flexible working hours within the organization because the organization kind of, uh, you know, releases you and they want you as an employee. So that's where HR then puts in flexibility for you to look at putting in hours. Is that okay? Yeah. Job sharing is uh, also this uh, kind of, um, you know, a simple concept wherein what tends to happen is if the department or if, if they download or for example, give a delegated job to a few set of individuals working within the team, then sometimes what happens is as, as peers or as colleagues, what you do is if you have a lot of workload, then you basically ask your colleagues informally, formally to say, okay, can you take this up? Can you pick this up? You know, I'm, I'm struggling with uh, finishing this. And in those cases, the manager is flexible because as long as they are getting the output, they are not too bothered in terms of who's doing the job. So sometimes they allow job sharing to happen within the teams which work on a large project or, you know, which work on a particular project. And this is what you get to see typically in large you know, uh, software organizations or organizations which have, uh, you know, uh, which are involved in R&D, for example. And that is where the concept of job sharing comes in. And then remote working is quite simple. That means now more and more organizations are saying that as long as the work gets done, we are happy and they're looking at reducing expenses in terms of office space and other bits. So they're happy for the employees, their employees to, you know, work remotely. And because of technology available, that would mean the employee is still connected can connect 
and do web meetings or you know do webinars or be a part of conferences and things like that remotely because they have the ability to be able to connect and still work remote and then sometimes you will see within the gig economy companies what they do is they allow the concept of all the three together flexible timing you know you look at uber for example if you are a registered driver with uber you can actually work flexible hours you can actually decline jobs you don't want to be taking up all the jobs you can you know or the rides as they say you can decline that some of them have kind of like the concept is because it allows them to work flexibly and in some cases if you look at people working within the homes they are able to kind of you know um in some cases if they are doing two jobs they are able to work remotely but at the same point in time because of this can make some extra bucks over the weekend and things like that so but from a concept of understanding here we are looking at this being a tool with an hr manager to be able to use internally within one organization with employees okay okay now when we look at the whole concept of you know um, motivation if i'm switched off irrespective of the fact whatever you try and do you give me a raise you you know give me a promotion but if i am not participative in that particular process and you don't see me participating there is there are no two ways that the hr can actually implement those changes within uh, within my job role or within uh, nature of job i do so here the concept of sometimes one of the techniques which hr uses is called participative management and this is a process wherein the hr actually takes inputs from employees to increase their commitments within the organizational success a clear example of this would be sometimes you get to see that most big organizations you know invite feedback or suggestions from employees throughout the year and this is to better the process or maybe better the uh, you know area of working and that is where is the concept of participative and representative uh, you know uh, management and participation comes in so let's look at that now participative management is where you ask your subordinates to uh, you know if you remember one of the leadership theories laissez faire wherein the leader actually delegates the responsibility of doing uh, delegates the responsibility or relinquishes the responsibility of making decisions so he leaves the decision making process to his team or his uh, you know his workers within his team so here participative management is also uh, something which is very similar to wherein they allow their peers or their subordinates to contribute significantly to decision making within the uh, you know for the role within the department or be the situation accordingly here the conditions typically when you see participative management happening would be that sometimes you feel that the leaders in that position or the manager in that position are not able to solve the issues it's not for them to step in and you know resolve this issue so they leave it to their subordinates to kind of identify the issues and then once the issues have been identified they ask them to come up with solutions to solve it right yeah again yeah. i will take an example here of a services organization let's look at seeing the example of tesco now the gm or the general manager of a large store might at the end of the month brief the employees or the workers within the store is that you know our level of theft or pill fridge as we say you know is increasing in the store and he has tried a number of uh, you know things like increasing security security tags a couple of other things which are standard practices but that still is not Uh, you know kind of bringing the pill fridge down or the you know theft cases down within the store so implementation of other techniques like cctv cameras and all that you know is is after the uh, is being reactive once the thing has happened now what does he do to kind of raise awareness of this and in how does you how do you think he will bring in the participation of his workers within the store to be able to control this situation can you think of uh, some ideas um um team meeting meeting that is correct okay yeah so he could look at you know uh, meetings which you could promote the concept of saying let's have a daily brief on this within the store before we start work in the morning before you start your shifts and look at maybe a revision or, or a you know kind of a checklist 
before you come out from the locker room or you know your uh, you know uh, before you come on to the floor for working what else could you think they, he would be looking at could do a daily handover yeah that process of daily handovers so for example if a supervisor leaves if you finish your shift you hand over and you make sure that the processes are being followed but look at it from a context of how does participated management and from this point of view the gm would look at motivating his staff to have more participation in this process to stop this activity of pilferage so these things that you mention are valid points but they are points which are valid because this is a process that they are following so they could have a checklist they could have uh, you know a proper handing taking over when the shifts changes happen uh, you know he could bring in some staff which is much more generally seen to be vigilant so he will bring in more people who are more enthusiastic into the shift and mix and match the shift management or the rota for the staff but what could be the other ways that he could look at straight away or directly looking at enhancing participation of uh, these individuals in that process and reduce pilferage or to bring across a change within a month um he could do like briefing sessions okay what else uh updates do you yes. see the changes um yeah. realignment of services yes and talk about what their future plans are that is also correct yes so for example all these things that you have mentioned these points are yes they are correct and they are looking at ensuring that the employees briefing sessions and you know they are competent they are kept on their edge and they are they this refresh of that you know the current issues happening one of the things which i'll throw into the mix to you know look at participative management would be that he might for example to keep them motivated and keep them engaged rather than use the word motivated i'll use the word engaged apart from doing these set of things that you mentioned he or she might introduce a reward for the month saying that if you catch or if you if you are able to pinpoint areas concrete areas of pilferages or stealing or theft within the store and are able to catch uh, you know or basically red handedly catch a few individuals then there is a reward that could be given and then the other bit would be so basically looking at engaging them by looking at a financial reward or a you know reward in the reward for the month you could also look at saying that i am open to suggestions i am open to ideas in terms of how we can better manage this and he might also say that okay for a month i am willing to pilot or trial somebody who just manages this as a activity within the store and for managing such activity you might put some financial incentive to keep the staff motivated and you know have that uptake happening within the store uh, and the employees would you agree with that yeah yeah so on the weekends when you look at you know when they are generally have more uh, customers visiting the store they have more staff because they want them uh, you know what they want obviously more business but they want the more staff more feet on ground in the sense one to be able to serve customers but also to keep a uh, make sure that the sales are happening and the third is replenishment in terms of stocks needs to happen more frequently and last but not the least they generally want to ensure that you know there are more employees available to look at this concept of pilferage or theft not happening so that could be one change wherein he might say that i might look at giving some additional hours to employees who want to volunteer and come in on the weekends that would mean participative management so he's trying to bring in more participation from a financial perspective to a cause which directly reduces loss or directly increases profit for that store correct yeah okay let's look at the reverse uh, you know a different concept which is representative participation so here you look at the concept of unions workers are represented by small group of employees who participation uh, participate in decision affecting personal so you look at work councils board memberships you know uh, you look at for example elections when happen unions when you look at so here the idea is you have a large body and you have selected or elected a few individuals to represent your uh, you know uh, cause and this then 
is because you're trying to lead a particular cause or you're trying to represent a particular purpose becomes representative participation. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. Now, going further, you know, we are looking at, you know, HR looking at rewarding employees. Rewarding employees could be pay benefits, you know, benefits or perks or bonuses that they look at. So those are things which, you know, obviously are, um, you know, things that we go through at some stage. But this is something which is essentially reading. There's not much to explain in this. So how do you look at application of motivation theories or HR motivating employees? You increase the pay, you know, with the kind of work that you are looking at doing. You make the wage, uh, wage pay variable. That means in some cases, some people who work within different shifts, people who come in and work during the nights or on bank holidays, they get a slightly higher pay because they are coming in on a holiday to, you know, obviously work within the store, right? If you're meeting the performance or exceeding the performance, you get bonuses. And in some cases, some areas require skill-based pay. That means I know how, how I can do plumbing, for example. I can take care of plumbing. But if I have to go out and do this on a daily basis, I do not have the skill to be a plumber. But I can make do with it sometimes when I have to do it. But skill-based pay would mean that if you employ, say, SAP consultant within the organization, and somebody who's working within the IT department of the organization, there is going to be a difference in terms of the pay that you'll pay both the people. Correct? Yeah. So Skill-based pay could be because of experience, could be because of uh, you know acquired skill, because of the rank. A, a chief executive officer will get paid more than probably a general manager. And that would mean that he has higher levels of responsibility. And that is where the pay difference comes in because of the job responsibilities they have from a point of view of managing that role. And in senior management level or mid to senior management level, you will see if the organize, they are given qualitative and quantitative goals, both. So qualitative goals are increase in market share, you know, taking market share away from the competitor, the department making profit or making savings. And those then will allow you to get more incentives, which are classified, you know, as variable pay programs and they could be things like we had employee stock option plan that means every year if the stock uh, price of the you know company uh, if the you know share price of the company actually rises in the stock market the chief executives or the senior management actually comes in to get a bonus they get employee stock option plans that means they can divest or sell those shares after a lock-in period in some cases you get compensation because if the company is making profit the team leaders or for example the the, the heads of department get some bit of profit sharing within the organizations. Have you seen the variable pay programs or heard about these variable pay programs? Uh, not them once, no. Right, okay. So in most consumer organizations, which are, you know, with, from which we buy goods and services, for example, here, you will look at, um, sticking to the example of Tesco for today, if you see the general manager is able to reduce filtering and stealing or you know um, uh, this kind of a theft within the stores and keep it below 2%, they get an annualized bonus because this is direct savings in terms of stock and inventory at the store. And this is an award which only top management in the store gets. Sometimes you see, um, I don't know, I was watching CNBC yesterday, so the chief executives uh, of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, the, from the time, you know, this is one organization which has only had, from from the time it, uh, you know, came about 40 years back, it has only had three chief executives. So you have Bill Gates, you have Steve Ballmer, and then the third one is Satya Nadella. Now, he uh, basically is the third executive under which the company's share price is uh, soaring. That means when uh, Bill Gates was at helm, you know, they, they, they did a public issue, whatever it is, you know, and the share price was about around $30 to a share. When Steve Ballmer came in, the price went down to about 22. When they announced the acquisition of Nokia phone, it went up to about $42. And then when they, at some point in time, were looking at taking over Yahoo, it went to $47. But by the time he left, the board actually threw him out is because the share price and the growth of the company was actually stagnating. So they internally looked at a person which could step into that road. He came in. And now the share price of Microsoft is soaring. It's probably at about 51, 52, and about $55, somewhere in that region, between 50 and 55. And because he's been at the helm for about three and a half years, and the company is doing quite well, he's reoriented the company, he has been given stock options. That means 
every three years he gets shares of Microsoft, which are worth six to seven million. And that is in addition to his salary package. Okay. And these are variable pay programs, which are normally introduced for senior, mid to senior management within the large organizations. Okay. okay. So when we look at council, for example, you have the leader of the council. Now the leader of the council has a fixed pay package, but also will have certain qualitative goals which they have to complete or achieve. And if they achieve those goals, they get bonuses or you know additional uh, perks and benefits, which could be classified as something called variable pay programs. Okay. Now other examples are how do you look at recognition? How do HR managers motivate employees? <clears throat> Sometimes you've seen that organizations have awards like you've done 10 years, so they give you a 10 year watch or, you know, you've been a, you, you've been a strong, uh, you know, a person going for 10 years in the organization. There are some intrinsic awards or rewards which the organization gives you. And that is for recognition. You know, you've been servicing or you've been in the company for about 25 years. They give you an award for a senior service that you've contributed so much over the last 25 years. So it could be recognition. It could be financial award. It could be something which is, you know, uh, a reward given to the employees who work within the organization for that long. You've seen that? You've heard about that? Uh, yeah, I have actually, but yeah, so not quite where I'm working. Place. Sorry, you heard about that? Not place at the place of? I've heard about it in other places, but not, not where I'm working. Right, okay, that's fine. A smaller, you know, not, not a smaller, but a different degree of that award could be employee of the month. You're not employee of the week. Um, yeah, I've heard that in workplaces, but not not where I'm working, because I'm working like local government. So right. we don't really have like employee of the week or anything like that. But we used to have these um, award nights where it would be like team of the year. Yeah, these are, there could be a difference, a variability of the award or some sort of a recognition. But sometimes you have these, uh, you know, Fridays or, you know, for example, events, which are small events, but they are basically to do a bit of a recognition, like uh, the HR might give you a birthday card or they might on that day, you know, organize tea, coffee, because you're a senior and a person within the organization. In some of the public sector organizations, it's not very openly done in terms of financial rewards. But it could be other ways of looking at rewards which are which are which are basically giving recognition and acknowledging the work that you do on a daily basis or the contribution that you make on a monthly yearly basis. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you classify this across an organization which works across geographies, so if you look at an organization like Vodafone, for example, there could be global implications in terms of how HR then looks at reward management. So if you've been doing very well in the UK and Ireland geography, they might make you a managing director for Western Europe. And that is a large in, uh, you know, kind of a sway in terms of promotion because you've been through the various stages, you put in number of years of experience. And at some stage you're at a level where the company does not want to let you go, but they have uh, what you call global plans for you. That means they will approach you in a way wherein they will not just enlarge your job or enrich your job, but they will also look at uh, giving you higher roles and responsibility within the organization. And this is where sometimes you will see that if you promote somebody within the organization and it looks like that you have superseded somebody who has more experience and more knowledge or you know has been contributing to the company for a number of years than the person being promoted could also have negative implement implications for the company. Sometimes you get to see that there are two employees who join at the same time have been performing quite well, but one of them gets promoted and another ends up, you know, feeling that, okay, I've been left out. Right? So in that case, the HR has to balance the act in terms of making sure that if both of them have been equally performing and have the same number of experience have contributed well to the organization, they then look at enlarging the role of both the individuals. One would be that they would stay within the company and maybe take up a larger role. The other would be given the additional responsibility of managing operations in another location or launching operations in another location. And would they would look at the concept of, okay, you go in and do a uh, build a team and then essentially look at, you know, uh, starting this operation in this place. 
So sometimes these approaches are also applied because they do see that the persons in some persons in the positions are more ambitious, and they then have to be given that outlet out, uh, outlet to be able to you know um, uh, uh, go and expand and obviously you know uh, work within the organization. Now. To summarize, what are the implications for managers? Well, how do you, how does HR look at it uh, in terms of you know looking at putting this into use as far as managing staff is concerned? Now, the key things that they look at is through this process of job enlargement, rotation, you know, uh, all the things that we've discussed, flexi timing, you know, variable pay programs, all that. It allows them to recognize different individuals with differences in terms of uh, you know what they bring to the organization. They use this as a strategy to give you know, specific feedback and set specific goals for the employees. So an HR manager then knows very clearly. They know very clearly where they have to take and where which what kind of work they have to do with that individual to make them more motivated or move them in a particular direction within the organization. In some cases, these programs allow employees to participate and affect decisions which are taken. Uh, for the betterment of the organization. HR managers use these techniques to link rewards to performance. So if you are performing well, you're achieving your targets, there might be bonuses, there might be options which will be given to you in terms of, you know, increase in job, uh, your job roles, responsibility, promotions and things like that. And what we need to keep in mind is as an HR manager, when you work within the organization, you have to keep the job description in mind, the skill set, and the contribution the employee can do when they work independently and with supervision and how they take feedback in has to be kept in mind for, for you to be able to manage that employee well or the staff well to keep them motivated. Is that okay? Yeah. So I think what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to send this presentation off to you and hopefully this will give you some more meat on the bone in terms of studying it at your own time and then look at it uh, you know, from the prospect of understanding this. And if you have any questions, queries, come back to me on email and we'll discuss this. The other two presentations, I'm going to send them to you, but we will start with the second one, coaching and mentoring uh, in the next session. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. I've got a bit of a handout, which I'm going to send to you as well on coaching and mentoring. And this is basically something that you, you should be able to use for assignment as well. And this clearly differentiates and provides you know very clear differences of why uh, what is coaching how is it different from entering okay we'll discuss some of these uh, in any case next week but um, i'm going to send them to you for you to look through and then uh, you know uh, we will discuss them uh, you know quickly when we do the coverage next week okay okay good stuff um any um, any questions, any comments on today's session? I think that's it, really. Right, okay. How are you coming along with your assignments? Um, I'm still working on business environments. Of, but I'm getting there slowly. And I will um, continue with it tomorrow. Is, is there a deadline for the assignments? What, what I'm going to do now is obviously we have to look at some deadlines because you know you have to join your top up um, and we're coming to a stage where I think we'll have to work through deadlines. What I will do is when I drop you an email today, I'm going to send you a second email with regard to some sort of a deadline so that you have that in mind when you're looking at doing the assignments. Okay. Is that okay? Because I think if we leave it too late, what, what is going to happen is one, it's going to pile up. Second, the main thing uh, which is going to happen is that, uh, you know, the certification uh, uh, is going to be late. We need to look at tagging that along as we go along. So for example, for October, we need to look at, you know, September is almost gone. I would suggest that you finish your business environment uh, in the next couple of days and, you know, try and submit it by the second to me. And for October, what we are going to look at is we're going to look at at least two or three units. I would say ambitiously three units to complete uh, in terms of assignments. And then okay. November, we look at additional three. So that would mean that at least you, you would have been uh, through with your level four, uh, considering that you would have covered eight units. So we've done 4.1 business environment, two resources, 
three communication, four people. So 4.4 and 5.3, I would suggest you do together because the assignments are quite similar. The content is quite similar. And because we are refreshing this as a unit in terms of covering this up now, you should try and attend after you complete the business environment assignment, try and complete the uh, people in organization, which is 4.4 along with 5.3. So 4.4 and 5.3. Yeah, they are very similar. This is people in organization and what we are doing now is people management. Okay. Okay. And then the other assignment that I would suggest is that you start off with that would be the personal and professional development, which is PPD 5.9 that we've done. 5.9. So 4.4, 5.3. If you've got 5. a pen and paper, we'll write this down. Let me, uh, you know, let's spend one minute on this and write it down, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just typing it in at the yeah. same time. So basically, your units, when you finish business environment 4.1, try and finish it before the second. So you can give us a first draft for, you know, for 2nd of October for marking. That's yeah. one. Okay. Now, when you do unit, the next unit that you start, you should either look at doing unit 4.2 or 4 look at doing 4.2 and 5.1 are very similar because they are resource related units. So you so, 4.2 is business res uh, resource resource management and 5.1 is managing sustainability within organization. So this okay. unit is all about these two units are all about resources. So 4.2, 5.1 is similar. Are, um, are similar, not exactly similar, but you will find that both of them deal with resources, physical resources, infrastructure, technological, HR. So it's resource related unit within an organization. Okay. And the other okay. one is 4.4, 4.3, and 5.3 are very similar units. They are progression units because you're doing two levels with us. So first you learn people in organization and then you learn how to manage people in organization. So resource management is the unit that you study at level four. And then once you know what are resources, you look at managing resources in unit 5.1. So managing sustainability in organization is nothing but managing resources within organization. And what's 5.9? 5.9 is personal and professional development. Okay, and is there a level four one to that no, one? There's no level four on this, no. Now the third, uh, the, after that, the similar unit is one is 4.3, which is basically communication and organization, communication skills essentially. And yeah. the other unit that we've done is managing communication, which is unit 5.5. So if you do these units together, you will find that your tasks will uh, happen quickly because the, uh, the content is very similar. So at level four, we teach you what are communication skills, which, which are the same skills, which are types of communication, the communication models, oral, verbal, body language. And at 5.5, you're looking at managing communication. So here we are looking at understanding of how you use communication skills at the managerial level. So for example, you have to write a letter, there's an activity to present uh, to a colleague, uh, you know, to colleagues in the organization through using a PowerPoint, the different methods of communication. So these are very similar units because they are leading on units from level four to level five. Okay. So 4.1, 5.1, 4.2, 5. 5. 5. Uh, sorry, 4.1 is 5.1, 4.2, sorry, again, my mistake. 4.2 is 5.1 leading on to 5.1, 4.3 yeah. is leading on to 5.5. Now the unit that we are doing, which is 4.3 is leading on to 5.3. 4.3. Sorry, 4.3 is 5.5. 4.4 yeah. leading on to 5.3. Okay. Right. So if I just to be clear, so that we've got this correct. I'll write it down for you. We have 4.1, which is business environment, which is something that you will cover with a subsequent unit in level five. You have 4.2, yeah. which is resource management. And this is what is leading on to 5.1, managing sustainability in organization. Don't mind my spellings. The other one is 4.3, which is communication skills. And 5.5, which is managing communication. And lead on units. And the other one that we are looking at is 4.4, people 
an organization and then 5.3 people management. Okay. okay. And then the other independent units are one is 4.9, which is finance for managers. And then you have 5.4, which is research project. So you have to pick up an area of research and, you know, uh, do a research uh, in terms of secondary research for this unit. And then you have 5.9, which is personal and professional development, in which we've done the SWOT analysis, the PPE, uh, you know, the CPE plan or the, uh, you know, kind of things that we've looked at uh, for self-learning organization. Some part of the content that we have covered in 5.9 is also going to be covered in people management. Training and development is a part of 5.9 as well. Okay. If I show this to you, uh, you know, uh, this is something which uh, should be uh, should be should be easily visible. If you look at these spec sheets here between 5.3 and 5.9, so here we are talking about uh, in this unit training and development. So you know your own development. How do you look at uh, maintaining your development? How do you review your de development? You know, look at self-managed organization, which is nothing but training uh, and development, which happens. And if you look at the bit of detail here, you will see that it is coaching and mentoring, which we are going to cover in 5.3, is actually covered, uh, you know, in unit 5.9 as well. Okay. So th there are bits and pieces of the unit because these are add-on leading units from level 4 to 5. You will see that, you know, uh, they, they will have some areas which are, you know, going to be overlapping. So communication, for example, is a part of this unit. And if I open up 5.5 and 4.3, you have communication clearly, you know, uh, this particular section is clearly there in that unit. So there is a potential of doing some mapping across the qualification as well, which would mean that, you know, there you go. So if you, if you at level four, when you do the assignment, there will be, you know, rather meeting the criteria, but at level five, you're showing the application of uh, the concepts essentially. Okay. So I think in terms of timeline, I'll drop you a quick email that, you know, tentatively we should look at these timelines for uh, these assignments. I would, uh, you know, rather than say, okay, for this one, let's look at a draft submission for 2nd October latest. And here for these next unit that you pick up, I would say you pick up uh, because we're doing the people management unit. I would say you pick this up. And you look at about you know 15th of October for this, and then you pick up uh, which is this, which is I would say by 30th October you should be able to give us this. Okay. You pick up else, which is say 15th November. You know, I would say you'd probably if you put in some time. You should be able to write up the assignment, uh, you know, in a week's time, a draft. And I would say, you know, finance for managers again, in, should look at picking up an area of research uh, now so that you are able to complete this by 15. But here you are looking at doing a bit of research in terms of, you know, uh, looking at a problem, which could be a small project that you pick up within your workplace as well. It could be an improvement project that you pick up. And that could be some areas that you identify what are the aims and objectives of why you're looking at this improvement project. How will it accomplish? Uh, what results could be accomplished when you complete this project? And then in the middle, you're doing a bit of literature review, which is to explain the problem, uh, you know, and find out uh, why this is an important project which needs to be done, how it can lead to things like improvement in productivity or whatever you want to look at in terms of work based. And CPD SWOT analysis that we've done is a direct part of your, uh, you know, assignment in this case. And here I would say you should be able to look at something like 30th November. And if you're able to do these eight units, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you're looking at about ten units that we need to look at for November. And then you have an additional two or three to cover, which we can cover off in December because um, I think everything kind of comes to a close during the Christmas, you know, around the 22nd, after 20th, 22nd, everything kind of comes to a, you know, uh, grinding halt. Okay. 
So you'll have maybe two weeks to be able to look at the last two units to complete something in terms of assignment. And then in January, we'll be looking at level five certification, but definitely, uh, you know, looking at your level four, uh, you know, uh, certification for November timeframe so that you have level four in your hand by November. And by January, you're looking at finishing level five. So that you have a bit of a break then, and you're ready to join your, uh, you know, top up in February. Okay. Is it okay? Yes, yeah, right. I'm going to email this to you now. Um, just a you know the draft that we've discussed. Okay. 